so today we're going to be making a four leaf clover for St. Patrick's Day or, you know, just because they're a fun plant to paint and, you know, it's almost spring. Even though over here it's still freezing cold. Um, so I've collected a few references of, you know, one four leaf clover and then these are just, you know, clovers in general. Um, so you can always look at a reference picture of a clover that only has like, you know, three or maybe more than three um, leaves and then kind of just make it up as a four leaf clover because we're painting a four leaf one because those are supposedly lucky. Um, so, you know, these references, I've gotten a mix of different greens. So I have ones that have more of a almost lemony green to them versus this is kind of a cooler green, a little bit more blue hues. So you can kind of adjust your colors from there because you can kind of see mine is more almost in the middle with my colors. I've added, you know, for highlights, a little bit more of my lemony green mixture and my base green is going to be sap green. So really, I'm just trying to use sap green, lemon yellow, Payne's gray, and, you know, maybe a few other colors if needed, but keeping my palette simple will kind of help me to also remember if I need to, you know, repaint something or add on to something. So with that, um, what I'm gonna start off with first is drawing my clover. So when you draw your clover, you can use just a regular graphite pencil to do your drawing. And this one's so simplistic, I'm probably just gonna draw it straight onto my watercolor paper. Um, this is Arches cold press paper. It's really nice for doing lots of layers. Um, and you know, the good thing about graphite pencil is it won't fade away with the watercolor, but that's also the downside to it. If you feel like you have a naturally like dark hand or push down really hard, um, then what I would go ahead and do is use a like water soluble graphite pencil. They do make those where, you know, whenever you put water, it'll float away the graphite or a watercolor pencil, which um, looks like a colored pencil, but if you add water to it, again, it's going to kind of fade. So I would probably use like maybe a yellow um, watercolor pencil because that may help everything to kind of fly away and it blends into our greens very nicely. So in general with plants, um, it's, you know, some of them can be pretty symmetrical or have kind of a radial design, like, you know, especially flowers when they're open, unless, you know, you're looking from the side of the flower versus up top. If you look from the top of a flower, they're typically kind of radial um, in shape. So I wanna try and look for the middle of my plant first and then start doing my petals individually. And I will probably mix up petals and leaves throughout the whole entire course of this video. So when I say petals, I mean leaves. I mean, you know what I mean. <laughs> so on my paper, I'm gonna leave a little bit to the side of my paper to practice um, kind of a water drop technique we're gonna do, but you could always draw, you know, your clover the same size as your picture, you know, a lot bigger, um, or you could even do more than one. Just in composition, you don't want to have, you know, two, sometimes the exact same size because that looks too man-made. Um, so a lot of times I'll do like one, one side and then one a little bit smaller, or even doing three helps to balance out a picture really well. One big, you know, one clover is in itself kind of balanced as long as you make your leaves interesting. So I'm just gonna draw mine over here. I'm gonna start off with a little dot for where the middle of my clover is gonna be. You can kind of see the dot. And I'm gonna start off with my first leaf. And these leaves are almost heart-shaped. So, but they're not perfect hearts. You know, if you really wanna try and simplify it for yourself, you could just draw a heart and kind of go from there. If it's easier for you to draw hearts than leaves. Um, but, Sometimes, you know, I these are almost like too stylized, even though that's what they look like in life. So I'm gonna go more for kind of in between the two where I have a little more of a simple little indent right here. So when I draw these, I'm gonna go out and I could do almost like a teardrop shape. And I'm drawing it very lightly, but you could go even lighter than I am just cause you know, lighter sometimes, as long as you can see it is better, just cause then you'll have less pencil lines. 
So I kind of start off with this basic shape. And before I get too detailed on this first petal, I'm gonna go ahead and plan where I want my other ones to go, just because um, you don't wanna have one beautiful and perfect, and then you end up running out of space for your other three. So now I'm gonna overlap. I think this one. And I'm gonna have my other one come over here. Okay, and now I'm gonna start working on my shape. So I'm gonna make this one go a little wider because it looks a little too round to me. And I'm gonna come in and make that little divot and the reason why I'm not erasing the lines yet is sometimes when we erase the lines we messed up on, we actually forget where we put those and we end up redrawing them in the same place. So it's good sometimes to leave your extra lines until you're sure you have your lines in the right place. And then I'll go back in and lightly erase those lines. Unless it gets too busy and you have too many lines, then you could probably go ahead and erase those. And I'm going to make this one. So this one right now is just ending nowhere. So I actually have to change my curve a little bit to make it go to my little middle point like that. And then I can draw a little stem off to the side. Ta -da. And then I would come in with a kneaded eraser rather than a regular eraser, just because your kneaded eraser is going to um, erase your lines a little bit gentler, but I may not have a eraser. Oh wait, I found it. Huh. Needed erasers are great because they're self-cleaning and the fact that, you know, if you need them, it'll clean them a little bit. So I use my kneaded erasers for charcoal a lot of times as well as watercolor. I would probably keep your charcoal ones separate from your watercolor ones though. Um, and then if I just needed to lighten my lines, I can use a kneaded eraser just to tap like that. But if I'm erasing something, I'll go back and forth. There you go. So that's my little shamrock. I probably need though to make hmm, probably more of a divot on this one. It doesn't seem very shamrock. There, okay, a little better. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna start mixing some of our colors. So, on my very messy palette, <laughs> I have a lemon yellow, which we're gonna use, and then I have a sap green and a Payne's gray. And Payne's gray is kind of like a bluey green. It makes really nice dark greens. Um, but the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to mix just some lemon green on my palette. So if I didn't want it to be contaminated, I already had a little bit of green on this palette, is I could take a wet wipe and just wipe out all of my paint that's old, like this brown. I don't really need this brown. Or you could just use, you know, a wet Kleenex or something like that. Ta-da! So I'm gonna put a little bit of water and my lemon yellow. Um, you may also have a color that's called like cadmium yellow light. That's basically the same thing. And depending on your brand, you know, sometimes it'll look different, like, um, I have a Daniel Smith kind of lemon yellow and it's very, very vibrant and way more than my uh, Grumbacher, so. And then I'm also going to, you know, kind of add a little water to it, make a nice puddle. You know, if you notice that your paint is really thick, that means you don't have enough water in it. So we need to have a little bit more water. And what I'm gonna do is do a base layer on my entire clover with this yellow. And what this does 
is it actually helps um, whenever we do the lifting process, it helps these to not be as bright as our white paper and also adds a little bit more vibrant vibrancy to our greens. Um, and some people will actually do almost like a underpainting with a yellow, especially on like floral paintings, just because it kind of helps you to give your painting more structure and more shape. So I'm going to take my yellow and what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm kind of using like the side of the tip and I'm not outlining my leaf. I'm just kind of starting from one side, curving my lines in the shape of the leaf. And going in towards the center. So, and the reason why we go in towards the center rather than out is a lot of times your paint, you know, will puddle up wherever you end. So if I end here, then down here is gonna be a little darker. So maybe if I wanted a darker edge, then doing the opposite would be better. And I would recommend, you know, going from here, skipping, because if you do one right next to it, you could end up causing blossoms where you push the other paint with extra water and it'll create a little bit of texture, which for plants isn't a bad thing. So if it happens, it happens. But if you wanna avoid that, that's how I would skip around. And if you feel like, you know, when you're doing this, your lines are really brush strokey, um, that could mean that you're using too small of a brush or not using like the side of the brush. Like if I try and just fill this using the tip of the brush, my lines are gonna be much smaller. So I'm using the side of the brush to get kind of more of a round feel and less brush strokes. And also my little stem down here. Ta -da. Okay, and then while that's drying, I'm going to go ahead and prepare my greens. And then I'll talk a little bit about our little practice area over here. So for my greens, I'm going to be using that lemon yellow again. And I'm cleaning off my paintbrush, grabbing a little bit of sap green. And I'm going to add a little sap green to my lemon yellow. So I get a nice vibrant green. And then I'm gonna have a puddle that's only sap green. Now, if you notice that your sap green, when you use it, is a little bit too like brownish green, sometimes that means you need to add a little more blue. So, but if your green is a little too blue, um, then you may have to add actually a little bit of red. So like, let's say I wanted to make this a little more blue. I'm gonna take a little bit of ultramarine blue or cobalt blue. And that helps to make it a little less yellow. Versus if I had too bright of a green, you know, and it was too happy, then I would use the complement of that green. Like this is a Viridian green. Uh, I would use the complement of that green, which is like cadmium red, because cadmium red's a very warm red. And if I add a little bit to that, see how it kind of dulls down that viridian green? So same thing with sap green. If your sap green was really blue, then I would just take a tiny bit of red and add it to that, hence tiny. And then my last color I'm gonna prep is gonna be our dark. So it's gonna be lots of sap green and some Payne's gray. So, and if you don't have Payne's Gray, you can just use a lot of ultramarine blue and like a touch of brown, just because Payne's Gray is just a really, really dark blue almost, or indigo. Indigo is a good supplement. Whoa, that was a lot, but it may work. So, there you go. So, you have our light, medium, dark. What I'm going to do is on the side of my paper, 
I'm going to go ahead and take my medium color, which is just the sap green, straight sap green, and I'm going to prep a little section of just a flat wash. And how you get it to be a flat wash is just loading your brush and going side to side, back and forth, so it's just a little layer of green. And then down below, I'm gonna paint some little petals with our lemon green, which will come in handy in a moment. And then I'm gonna let these dry for a second, and then we're gonna start working on our next layer. So now that these petals are fairly dry, uh, we're going to go ahead and practice the te techniques we're going to use on those little ones. So what's kind of fun about doing petals and organic things is you can kind of leave a lot of the natural just, you know, blossoms and texture uh, from watercolor and not have to worry about everything being super smooth. Of course, it depends what kind of painter you are. You know, some people like it perfectly smooth and that's fine. So a couple of techniques I'm going to do is... I'm gonna first take a little bit of my lemony green and on my petal, what I could do is on like the area I want to be a highlight, I'm just doing another coat of that lemony green. And while that's wet, I'm gonna take my medium green and I'm just bringing them almost all the way over so that they just touch like that. So another thing you could do for our first coat is instead of doing, you know, where they meet, I could actually do one as a section and leave a line in the middle, which they're still gonna bleed a little bit just because they're both wet, but with this way, they're a little more separated. So, which is kind of interesting because you can kind of start making that little line that's on the leaves there, but I feel like it's a little boring. So I may, you know, kind of combine the technique and drop in a bit of my sap green while it's still wet. So, but it's up to you which kind of technique you prefer. So when I'm using that technique on my actual petals, if you had really large petals, leaves, <laughs> Um, you could pre-wet them first, just because, you know, if you're using larger paper, you know, you have a bigger amount of space. Mine are pretty small, so I don't have to pre-wet them first. I'm just remaking a bit of my colors off to the side. So, and what I'm going to start with, so my yellow is dry. And I'm going to start with the petals that are on top, because the reason for that is I can actually use... Um, the petals underneath and their shadows to edit the petals on top. So that's why to me it's a little bit better to do the petals on top than the ones underneath. But again, you know, doesn't mean you have to do it that way. <laughs> so this one is on top of this one. So I'm going to go ahead and paint this one first. And I'm using my lemon yellow mainly to one side where I want my highlight to be. And then while it's wet, I'm going to grab my sap green and just dropping it in right next to it. And I'm kind of just tapping in, you know, I'm not like painting over it too much because that'll help them to naturally kind of get along and not have too many lines in my watercolor. So, and then if it didn't seem vibrant enough, I could even go in with straight lemon yellow and drop it in on the side. But that may cause more texture and more blossoms, which I like. But if you're afraid of getting too many blossoms, you know, you could always wait and add that in once it's dry. So, and then while that one is drying, I'm going to go across to this one and do the same thing. Do a little lemony green. And then 
and some sap green. So and in general, we don't really want to outline our leaves. So even if I am kind of, you know, outlining right here, I'm very quick to pull that color into my leaf before it becomes an outline. So that's why I kind of go along the leaf and work my way around rather than outlining and then filling in. And that's okay. I made an oops. If ever you do do that, you can always take a little water and scrub it, but it's okay. Life goes on. All right. So now next is a tricky bit because all of this is now wet. So I could either wait for this to dry a little bit um, or you could always, you know, just go right in and separate them later. So I'm going to go ahead and go right in. And what I'm going to do, so since this area is light, then I'm going to make also this side of this petal light. I'm going to take my lemony yellow and then just my sap green and then where I get close to this wet petal I'm trying to use less water in my paint a little more paint and this won't be as dark as the shadow we're going to make, but it'll be a start. And I'm kind of outlining, but then pulling the color back real quick. Great. And then I'm gonna do my other one across the way. So this is just a base layer on our petals. Um, you can kind of see, so this is one that's kind of in the middle of the final and this stage. Um, we're gonna come back in once it's a little bit drier and start adding a bit more shadows. And uh, while that's drying, I'm gonna show y'all how to do lifting. So lifting is really great for, you know, when you have those little lines on a flower petal, on a leaf, you know, on these clovers right here. And it's really not like a dark line. It's actually, you know, kind of an implied line that's made with how light this side is and how dark that side is. So, and to kind of help me create, start to create that line, um, once my petals were a bit drier, I would come in with a firm flat brush um, so I have one that's not this one, but I have a different one that's a brand Royal Lay Nickel. And they're paintbrushes that are actually meant for acrylics, but they're so nice and firm, they work well for lifting and watercolor. So I'm gonna take this flat brush with a little bit of water, and we'll see if this brush works okay. <laughs> it's been a while since I used it. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm kind of pulling the color upwards and then after you lift a little bit you want to wipe it off or clean it off because if you lift and you just keep going and going you're really just reapplying that green paint right in the same spot so I'm kind of cleaning it off lifting and I'll show you with the other one and when you lift you want to think about kind of the direction that this petal is going so these petals I want to try and curve kind of at an angle. So 
So, and this may not be the best brush for lifting just because you can kind of see when I'm lifting, it's getting a little floppy. And especially if it's too soft of a brush, you're not gonna get a good enough lift than you would with a really stiff brush. So let's try this one a little bit. Ah, oh, that's a little better. And you know, painting is a lot of, you know, problem solving. If something's not working, sometimes it's not you. It's the paintbrush. <laughs> So, and I've lifted a little bit over there. The other thing you can lift is they do have these fun little patterns on them that go in kind of a circle pattern on here. So to, the way to do those is again with your lifting brush, but kind of scrubbing, wiping it off, scrubbing. And if you're doing lifting and nothing is showing up, it can sometimes be that your uh, greens are too light. So, like my greens are pretty light, so that may be why they're not working too well. And then if my petals were pretty dry, I could come back in on the opposite side of this stripe and blend in a little shadow. So that's my Payne's Gray and Sap Green mixture. And that helps just to make that little line show up a bit better. So we're kind of almost outlining, but then quickly pulling it away. And then, so my leaves are still pretty wet. So I'm also going to go ahead and work on my stem. So same thing with the stem. You want to think about where your light source is coming from. So, you know, since this part is angled up, it may be closer to the sun than this bottom part. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do a layer of green all over my little stem, a little bit lighter on this side. And then I'll take my shadow color and put a little bit more right underneath our leaves and to the side. Oops. Now that my petals are nice and dry, what I'm gonna start doing is a little bit of lifting. So I'm gonna take my brush, and again, you don't want it like sopping wet. You want your brush to just be a little bit wet. And when I'm lifting, I'm trying to just curve slightly to go with the direction of the petal. So this one, you know, is a little more kind of flat versus, you know, this one I may want to curve a bit more. So I'm going to try and arc my line just a little. And again, you kind of have to rinse off your brush and lift again if it's not lifting very strong. Let's see, I'm going to lift this one. And you know, you're kind of going and using the what's called the skate of the brush, which is like this part. You don't want to try and lift with this part. We're just using like the very thinnest part of the brush. And there you go. So and of course, what's great about lifting is you could just paint over it and relift <laughs> or make it smaller using your other colors if it didn't work out very well. So now I'm going to take my shadow colors. And an important thing with these leaves is as they go away from us, they're going to get darker because they're going away from us in space. So things as they go away, you know, are less close to the light. So we want to really feel that curved edge and how it's going curving, going away from us. So especially the edge of my little petals, leaves, whatnot, thingies. <laughs> I'm going to take a little clean water and pull it up so it slowly gets lighter and there's not like a big line between, you know, the dark and the light.
And then same thing for over here. And especially for where this petal is underneath this other petal. And a little water. So, and since this section is so dark, I need to balance it out by darkening a little bit over here. Like that. And I need to make a little more Payne's Gray mixture for my palette. So and I'm going to skip around and kind of go over here. Then use a little water or, you know, if there's a big change in between your dark color and your light color, sometimes you may have to, instead of using just water, actually come in with lemon yellow and do another coat of that while you're doing this dark. So, and you know, we're kind of embracing the fun texture, the blossoms, because that makes it seem a little more natural and have a little more fun texture. And if I'm adding my shadows, maybe I overdo it and I lose my little middle line. I can always re-lift that out again. That's perfectly fine. Um, and always be thinking about, you know, the shape, you know, don't just do a formula. I mean, you can kind of do a formula, but you want to think about like, okay, well, which one of these is going to be underneath the other one? And that's going to kind of decide, you know, how you shade each of these. And with watercolor, you can always glaze like and go darker. Um, but it's harder to get those light colors back in. So that's why really keeping your water is really important and keeping kind of those light spaces. But I can always come in with like just straight lemon yellow and just drop in some of that bright color. You know, it'll make kind of a nice difference, but not a huge difference. So you still have to be kind of careful. So let's pretend I did all those petals. <laughs> Then what I would do is come in with, again, your lifting brush. And if you wanted to do that kind of fun pattern, then you could come in and lift. You know, once they're dry. And I would go all the way around with your clovers. So, and then the next thing we're going to do is practice water drops. So that's why we have this little paper over here. Um, so water drops are really fun to do on plants, on flowers, on apples, really anything. Um, and kind of the basic anatomy of a water drop is you want to make sure that you have, so a main highlight, and that's like the brightest part of your water drop. You have a bit of reflected light, which is where, you know, the light's kind of going through the water and just a hint of it is at the bottom. You never want your reflected light to be as bright as your highlight. That's the brightest part. And then we have a cast shadow and a little shadow inside the drop. So and our cast shadow is, you know, just a darker layer of our main color back here and our highlight <laughs> oh, bless me. <laughs> Our highlight is actually made with white acrylic paint. So you could also use like white gouache, but I like white acrylic paint just because it doesn't move around as much um, whenever I'm using it. And then you're going to leave like the middle section is your middle value. So kind of the value of your petals. And you have to think about, you know, we don't really want to put water drops in really dark areas. It's hard to get that kind of variation um, in values in really dark areas and also in really light areas. So I try to stick it to mostly medium areas. It makes it a little bit easier to put those on. 
So, and then next, what I'm gonna use is my pencil. Um, a really, really small round brush is great for little water drops. Um, basically the same colors, you know, this is sap green. My leaves are mostly sap green, so I really just wanna have more of that and then some white acrylic. So for my white acrylic paint, I just have Liquitex Basics, but you know, Liquitex Basics or any acrylic paint would work. You just wanna make sure it's not too runny. And I'm gonna go ahead and put this, I would probably put it on like a separate palette just because when acrylic dries, you know, it kind of sticks, but it's kind of easy to get off though. You can sometimes just peel it off and it's kind of relaxing. But if you're worried about that, I would probably put it onto a separate palette. Um, so for our drops, I'm just going to draw a circle and you want to draw this pretty lightly. And to practice, the bigger the better, because they get harder as they get smaller. Um, so you want to make sure that you maybe practice it really big and then slowly get smaller. So I have my little circle. And then what I'm going to do next is, again, I'm going to take my sap green from my palette. And I'm going to do my little cast shadow. And you don't want to stick it just as like an outline. Normally I try and make the shape a little bit bigger than too thin of a line. And then I take a little water and kind of go back and forth to fade the edge into the paper. So sometimes if you have a different brand of paper, like Canson or I can't remember any other brands. Um, they sometimes are better at lifting, so you may have a harder time just trying to blend and fade something, you know? Or sometimes it just takes a little more practice. Water drops especially are very technique based and sometimes just takes a bit of practice. And then I'm gonna do, so this is my cast shadow underneath the circle. And then inside of my circle, like right inside, I'm doing a shadow like this and the bottom is kind of curved and I'm going to use my water and kind of rotate my brush to blend it into my medium value like that. And then we're going to take a little water and we're going to thin down our acrylic paint or gouache, whichever you decided on. And now on the inside of my circle, but at the bottom, I'm gonna do a little reflected light. So if it looks too bright or the line is too defined, then you just use a little water to fade it because acrylic is also water soluble. You can almost use it like a watercolor, which is kind of fun. And then, you know, you may wanna wait for the dark spot to dry, but, then I put in my little highlight like that, and now you have a water drop. So, and again, takes practice, takes time. I've done a million water drops to try and get a handle on it. <laughs> so, and then if maybe you wanted to do like a funky shaped water drop, you kind of do the same steps, but you just have to think about, okay, well, you know, since this shape is a little longer, then my cast shadow is going to be a little longer. And also my highlight may change shape a little bit. So let's say I was doing, you know, a drip that was going this direction. Normally they get, you know, a little smaller where they're coming from. So then I would do my cast shadow first. Whoops. So I want it bigger where the drop is bigger and then slowly get a little smaller. I'm gonna take my water. Sometimes you can tell if you have too much water if it just puts a puddle on your paper. So you may have to touch it to the side. Like that. Then I take a little bit and again, 
So it's on the opposite side, but not as dark as our cast shadow. It's like almost as dark. And I blend that a little bit. And my reflected light. You kind of curving it up a bit. Oh, it's a little too bright. So, whoops. Let me take a little water and blend it in. And then on the opposite side, we swoosh in our little highlight. There you go. So, and I like to kind of trail that highlight up just a little bit so it kind of fades up. But that's basically how you do water drops. Um, and then what I would do is that, you know, you don't have to put water drops on your shamrock, but it's kind of fun to do. Same process. Um, you know, you could also use a watercolor pencil to draw your lines if you were worried about having too much pencil line on there. But I normally just use, you know, kind of a light pencil. And then same process. I have my cast shadow. You know, and if you put a water drop in kind of the darker area, you'll do the same steps, but you just have to go darker. Or let's say you were doing it on a rose, then you would just have to think about, okay, you know, what is the main color of my rose? And then you'll just go a little darker for all your shadows. And there you go. So, and then once everything dries, if sometimes your water drop doesn't look like it's showing up enough, sometimes it can be the shadow. So like this one doesn't show up very much versus these two are really evident. And that's because these have a little bit of a darker cast shadow. So hope you enjoyed this video and happy painting.